Hello, uh, welcome to the first talk of the inaugural Digital Summit at Art Dubai. My name is Brian Droikor. I'm the editor-in-chief of Outland, which is an online magazine about digital art. And I'm proud to that Outland is the strategic media partner of Art Dubai Digital for the second year in a row. Uh, I think our missions are very aligned. Outland is all about um, developing and expanding the discourse around digital art and culture and Art Dubai Digital is representing that ecosystem and how it's forming. Uh, I think it's a really exciting fair because you walk through it and there will be a traditional gallery, an NFT marketplace, a studio that represents artists and assists them in producing commissions, and then also like private collections that are just working to uh, increase the, the visibility of digital art in traditional institutions. So there's a huge diversity of stakeholders in the space that are represented here. And I think it's exciting that the Digital Summit has been established to um, explore that further and flesh it out through conversations like the one we're going to have tonight. So the focus is uh, independent communities and how they are pushing culture forward. Um, you know, like I said, there are a lot of different kinds of actors in the digital art space. And here we have four people who are all involved in different kinds of organizations and doing great work, so we're going to hear from them. Uh, we have Carlotta De Chao, who's the founder of a new platform called Viv Arts. Uh, Celine Juan Katzman, who's the co-director of the School for Poetic Computation. Uh, Wasim Alcindi, who is the creative director of OX Salon. And Ana Maria Caballero, who is an artist, poet, and a co-founder of The Verse Verse, which is a NFT marketplace. So to start, I'd just like to ask you to say a bit about the communities that you work with, what you do. And also, since I think the word community is abused a lot and contested, um, I'd love to hear you each talk about how you define the word community and how that definition informs your work. Yeah, why don't you start, Carla? Hi everyone, um, my name is Carlotta. I'm the founder of VivArts, co-founder. Um, and I built VivArts, or I'm building rather VivArts because uh, I believe that the future of art lies in experiences. Um, we are building a platform where we invite artists to sell collections of digital arts and use the, the funds from the digital artwork sales to finance uh, physical, immersive, interactive, time-based experiences. Um, and once experiences are up, uh, the artists, sorry, the collectors of the digital artworks are invited to the opening, they're invited to uh, meet the artist, and they're invited to connect with one another. Um, and the result, hopefully, is uh, pockets of communities that are built around uh, the common thread of these interactive, inter uh, immersive, um, participatory artworks. And in this context, for us, um, we're trying to create this kind of I guess, dialogue between digital communities and physical connection. Um, as you say, the word community can be used in so many different ways. Um, and it's undeniable that, you know, di digital communities exist and they're thriving and they're strong. We obviously saw it with the, the result of the pandemic. Um, but we're very strong believers that physical connection can actually create a resilient and a community that lasts. And it's through that interaction, through understanding the nuance of, of the different individuals that maybe share common interests, common beliefs, etc., cetera, um, can really create something really special. So that's why we're trying to create that, that hybrid between, between the two spaces. Thank you, Celine. Hi, um, my name is Celine Wong Katzman. I'm co-director at the School for Poetic Computation. I'm also a curator. Um, we're based in New York and online. Uh, SFPC was founded in 2013, so it's been around for a while and it's gone through a few leadership transitions and communities like within itself already. Like we're like a teenage organization, I guess. Um, and we're an experimental platform for the study of art, code, poetry, um, political organizing, like so many different um, things <laughs> that it's hard to name them all. Uh, but I feel um, that we're like a really values aligned community and organization. Um, and there's a strong, like, I feel like really what we're focused on now is in response to the summer 2020 protests really shaped the kind of mission of the school. Um, sorry, I'm like rambling a little bit, um, but I'm a nervous public speaker. <laughs> um, we 
used to be in person at West Beth until the pandemic. West Beth is a uh, artist, subsidized artist housing space in New York that um, ho like housed Nokia Bell Labs as well as like Merce Cunningham Studios. So it has like kind of art historical significance. Um, and we ran a residency program there and then went online during the pandemic. And so now we reach like a few hundred students per year via online classes about these topics. <laughs> and how do you def define community? Yeah, thanks for... <laughs> I was trying to dodge that. No, um, I think, well, I think for us, our community is definitely organized around shared values um, and, like, shared politics, probably, I would say. Um, and I think there's no... Obviously, this word has been, as you mentioned, like, abused, and I feel like, in a way, it has so many meanings, it's become a little bit meaningless. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I would say for us, yeah, it's very values oriented. Okay, thank you. Uh, Wasim. Uh, hey everybody, I'm uh, Wasim al Sindi, and uh, primarily a scholarly researcher, but a few years ago, um, together with some friends in Berlin, we started a, a community, well, I, I won't use that word right now, a collective <laughs> project called the Zero X Salon, and it uh, grew out of an event series, uh, which we held a workspace called Trust, uh, where we got together uh, people from different uh, persuasions, like epistemically and also in terms of different stages in their careers and lives, uh, to discuss unusual topics around, let's say, tensions and insolubilities in digital culture. Um, so we've had about 50 of these uh, intimate post-disciplinary conversation sessions that we call salons, um, and a community formed around those. We'll get to that later. Um, we then started to uh, produce materials, uh, written ones, um, and then like audio reports, and then also various kinds of art uh, to chronicle and communicate the things that we were discussing in these uh, 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 sessions to the outside world. We started a residency program so that we could uh, engage in some kind of like mentorship and uh, giving something back, paying it forwards to the, the next generation of uh, young artists and thinkers and doers that are, that are coming up. Um, and uh, we kind of morphed somehow into a creative studio as well. We started producing uh, various kinds of uh, media art, uh, lore, philosophy, visual art, games, and uh, all kinds of other uh, stuff. And I guess, like, the way I think of community, the way I define it, is like, you know, building on what we were just talking about, what Celine said, it's about, like, we have these shared values and shared intentions, and we might be at different stages in our, like, artistic or our scholarly or our intellectual journeys, um, but we can... Uh, chart a path forwards to, towards a set of common goals. And um, I think it's, for me, it's really about a group of people that want to engage in endeavors together and support each other. Thank you, Anna Maria. Hello, everybody. Um, it's great to be in Dubai. <laughs> I still can't believe I'm here. Um, my name is Ana Maria Caballero. I am originally from Colombia, but now based in Madrid. I am a poet and artist. Um, I'm actually exhibiting at the fair at the Gazelli booth, X23. Um, and we'll be giving a reading tomorrow at 5, if you'd like to come. Um, and I'm also a co-founder of Literary Gallery, The Verse Verse. What is a literary gallery? Um, we, I think, uh, pretty much invented the term because there wasn't anything like this before. So we are a digital poetry gallery. We specialize in onboarding traditional poets from, you know, traditional publishing land, from po poetry world, um, pairing them with digital artists to create um, immersive digital works of art that we're all in, um, you know, in Web3 familiar with, inter engaging with. So um, MP4s, JPEGs, etc. cetera. Uh, we also work with text-based artists who are already um, working in the, in the digital sphere. And um, we also um, help writers, traditional writers, experiment with artificial intelligence, with large language models. Um, but our, our real mission is to engage with communities, with um, the traditional writing world, and teach them about the potential of the blockchain. Um, and at first, you know, I, I really like the questions that you sent, Brian, because I, I was so apropos that you asked, you know, what does community mean to you? Because for me, it's evolved. 
For me, words are living things. They evolve. If you, you know, ask somebody 500 years ago what the word cathedral meant to them, it probably meant you know, center of the world or heart or something like universe. But if you ask somebody today, it might mean something like a monument or like history or something dusty. And to me, community at the beginning, when I first entered Web3, I had an image in my mind of hundreds of writers just galvanized, speaking the word of, of the blockchain, saying this is going to change the way that we transact and value our, our verse, our poems, our texts. But that's evolved because the support that we've received from the verse first has actually come from organizations more like Art Dubai, more like Outland, more like OX Salon, um, organizations that aren't from traditional writing. And it's been the poets who've been a little bit slower to, to take it on. So for me today, community means like-minded. Um, if you're open to new ideas, if you're open to change, if you are curious, then I feel that we are in community. Thanks, that was really beautifully said. So I think it's interesting we have, um, Selena was seen from organizations that are sort of pedagogical enterprises and Ana Maria and Carlotta who work with organizations that are a little bit more like commercially oriented, finding ways to support artists and um, like fund experimental practices. Um, but all of them kind of fall under the rubric of independent because that often means struggling to get money. Um, and so I'm kind of curious what, what independent means to you. And I guess, I, maybe Celine, I'm kind of curious to hear your take on this because I know SFPC started, it was totally funded by tuition of the students who would, who would pay and that was what um, paid for the teachers and the space. But you said that recently you've gotten some grants from some big foundations that allow you to make tuition free and offer scholarships. So um, has that, changed your orientation. Um, also, I'm kind of curious, of the rest of you, like, have, do you seek out like VC funding and what effect does that have on the way you work? So uh, yeah, I'd just like to talk about what independence means. Yeah, I think that's a really great question. And I think the school definitely was formed as an alternative to the broken higher education system in the US. Um, and particularly is important because not just studying technology, but studying, or that word also, another meaningless, not just studying, okay, we, we like to say it's a place to study computation where computation isn't the point. Like I think being playful, being whimsical, studying tools that often have a kind of cap, like capitalistic use, but like having fun with them, like making space for people to do that who don't have the money to pay, like hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, was important to us. And then of course, like we inherited this um, like tuition-based model from the folks who started the school. And it's not that it's so bad in a way because it does, like the tuition is much lower. <laughs> so it's right now to take, for example, a 10 week class at SFPC, which makes, meets once a week, two and a half hours, it's $1,200. Um, and you can take them one by one, so I think that's like more accessible than a university, but not totally accessible. Um, but it does illustrate that there's community buy-in to like participate, and like we have been, you know, we went from offering a 10-week residency program for 20 students twice a year to offering four seasons of like as many as six classes with perhaps two sections per class where one section of a class is 20 people. Um, and, and like there's really high demand for it. So I think like that, you could say that that's independence because we're like not um, beholden to the kind of, you know, like I mean, more stalwart and like kind of bigger institutions are beholden to different stakeholders and because we are like, quote unquote community funded in a way, we aren't as beholden, although we are moving now towards filing for 501c3 status because we've been recognized by some of these larger institutions and I think we wanna keep both. <laughs> we wanna keep all the money. <laughs> no, we wanna, we wanna just have, I mean like to use like business language, I guess you know like have a diverse income so we can maintain the independence that comes from to, you know, like uh, tuition paying folks or hopefully 
folks who can afford to pay tuition, wanting to pay tuition, wanting to pay for someone else to have that experience because they understand that it um, improves the learning environment. Um, like we want to keep that because it allows us to do things that foundations won't fund. We also want to um, create more stability for the staff, um, more stability for our ability to offer scholarships. And so, yes, foundations are also like good for that. <laughs> so yes, both. <laughs> Um, it, it does seem like, uh, I, I just am thinking about talking to people in DAOs. I think a lot of people here are in the Web3 space. They know that like these decentralized autonomous organizations where you like buy a token or a membership and then you're part of this online group that might have some in-person things. Like, like people who organize those talk about the importance of having a buy-in. Like there, there is some kind of financial stake that motivates people to participate. And so it sounds like you're sort of thinking about that in terms of tuition paying students. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm curious to hear your take on that, Carlotta, because you are like sort of wanting to build a community around um, collecting. Yeah, um, yeah. The idea how does that like play into like the independence of your organization or how you orient? Yeah, it's it, independence is an interesting word, and actually, from hearing your question, it made me realize that I guess our mission is to um, grant independence to the participating artists that they may not have had uh, previously. So. By, um, so I used to work at an um, experiential art gallery um, where the funding came centralized uh, from the gallery to the artist. Uh, the artist was commissioned to create an artwork and then tickets were sold um, to A, recoup the investment and then B, pro make a profit. I mean, that was the whole business model. Um, the result of that was that t I felt there was too much pressure being put on the actual artwork, the outcome by the artist, because of that reliance on ticket sales. Um, and in fact, it actually was at times, not always, but at times to the detriment of the artwork. Um, at VivArts, what we're trying to do is push the financial side away from the, from the output of the artist and into these collections of digital artworks that by their nature are, are tradable assets um, that can be seen as financial assets. Um, and so we basically invite the artists to maybe in fact um, use that digital art collection as a way to show the process of the work reaching to the output. So um, giving the artist the, the freedom and independence to then create what whatever dream project they want to create. That is on one end. The other end that grants independence to the artist is the use of uh, NFT technology. So the, all the digital artworks will have an underlying NFT token. Um, and the reason we want to do that is because we believe that the artist should be the owners of the data, the metadata, the collectors that they, in the community that they built through their collections and through their experiences, et cetera. So if they want to go away and work on another project but still be able to contact all the collectors of the NFTs that they built and all that community that they built using our project, we want to grant them that, we want to empower them to, to you know, they, they created that, so it's, it's definitely there. So it's by using NFT technology and also by um, making that NFT technology and that NFT space the financial side of the project, hopefully the outcome will be greater independence for the, for the creator. Thanks. Um, Anna Marie, does that resonate with um, your work with the Verse First, thinking about the relationship between independence and I mean, funding methods? We, we have a grant. Um, we've received grants at the Verse Verse, and um, you know, there's reporting requirements. Um, we're not a non for profit, but we don't make any profit. Um, and I feel like people recognize the value of what we're doing, the value of our message, the value of changing another broken system, which is traditional publishing, where um, you know, many writers are questioning if it's even worth it to go through the entire process because um, you know you go to an MFA, you train to be a writer who's going to create something new, something different. You read the few works that are experimental that get published, and then you face the reality of getting your work published. Um, and you know, even if you do get it published, you will not make any money. Um, I can guarantee that because I have gotten five books published and I've made no money from any of them, um, but I do it because I love books. And it's not just for the money, but there needs to be a sustainable model at some point developed around the creation of poetry. And you know, we're not pretending to have the absolute answer, but we are asking the questions. 
Um, and you know, one of one of the questions that that resonated from that you asked Brian was about onboarding, and you know, in a way, independence to me has to do with onboarding because it's been such an intense task to onboard poets. Some of them are older onto Web three, um, but at the same time, it's worth it because then they go out and they tell their students, they tell their press. They tell their peers, they've been talking about what we're doing, and there is a momentum that is building um, where people recognize that we need to start teaching students in MFA programs about digital poetry, about new forms of publishing that doesn't depend on a tiny, broke, independent press that is just not going to be able to support you as a writer. Thanks. Uh, Wasim? I think uh, independence is a very good word to describe the Zero X Salon. We're so independent, we have no idea how to sustainably fund or finance our operation. <laughs> um, so we've been kind of scrabbling and moving between different kind of approaches and, and verticals. And um, uh, like we've just heard, like, you know, there's grants available. Um, so the Salon is based in Europe, it's in Berlin. And uh, we've had grants from the European Commission from their STARTS program, which is this interdisciplinary uh, endeavor to connect science, technology, and the arts. Um, we made a theater production and a computer game about uh, Bitcoin's proof of work uh, in 2022 under those uh, auspices. Uh, we've had small amounts of benefactor uh, funding, which have come from um, friends of the salon in the Web3 space. And um, yeah, we've had some commissions as well for various projects and various bits of writing. Uh, but we are really doing it very, in a very piecemeal way. And um, you know, for the um, ambitions that we have and for the uh, work that we managed to do, um, we're extremely efficient with the, number, the amount of resources we have. We've had to learn how to be very lean about these things. Uh, but it's sometimes a little bit frustrating. Like, we know that we could do so much more if we had a little bit more um, resources at our disposal. So if you think you can help about that, come and see me afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, yeah, I think, um, you know, when we talk about independence, I think there's like a little step over to the, the concept of an institution. And, um, you know, we're at Art Dubai, and there are many, you know, very storied and uh, well-established institutions. Um, but there are also things that are coming up. Like, you know, obviously we're in, here in the Digital Summit, and uh, around the corner in the digital part of the fair, there are many, what you could say, are nascent institutions. There's also this kind of helpful parallel concept of the parrot institution or the counter institution. And they kind of fill in the gaps or the cracks in between these, you know, they could be like the the cement in between the bricks of the institutions. And who knows, these kind of upstart uh, organizations might become the institutions of, of tomorrow. Um, but the independence is something that you know, we treasure very highly, and we don't want to sacrifice that in return for uh, the kind of in institutional, institutional legitimacy and credibility that uh, an organization might get from uh, maturing into a bigger player. So for us, it's like a trade-off. It's a balancing act. Thanks for that. So um, Anna Maria kind of spoiled one of the questions I had about onboarding, so maybe we can move on to that. Um, I think a lot of the exhibitors at Art Dubai Digital sort of have, in the last few years, encountered this uh, dilemma. Like, do you reach out to people who love art, who collect painting and sculpture, and teach them how to um, collect and preserve digital art and maybe like get a crypto wallet, or do you go to people who are really into decentralized finance and sort of teach them what it means to collect art. Um, and both are very challenging uh, endeavors. So I'm kind of uh, curious, like what, and, and I think in general, like working with uh, new technologies um, in, in different ways often means um, education and, and sharing some kind of knowledge. And I think, you know, SFPC does that in the form of like teaching classes. But I'm kind of curious how all of you think about onboarding um, or if, if there's another prefer, uh, term you prefer to describe that process and how it plays into community building. Well, I can say one thing about um, the, I guess the impact that the whole Web3 speculative bubble of 2021 um, and the impact it had on the contemporary art world because it really, on one end, it kind of, I, I was uh, already selling digital art as screen-based works before, prior to 2020, and the conversation was completely different. 
we were treating digital artworks as objects first and foremost. Um, we were uh, educating, I guess, the collectors on how to install the works, how to live with the works, how to maintain it, maintain them, all these different conversations. And then this huge boom happened and all this new set of collectors came into the picture that maybe had never uh, thought about collecting art. And all of a sudden they were interested in art and all of a sudden they were art collectors. Um, and that had a huge influence in the contemporary art world. I mean, we could, well, we're seeing the impact here at Art Dubai, they have a whole digital section. So I think that um, it's interesting how this onboarding process came from pure speculation and from the financial side of, of uh, making a quick buck with, with NFTs. Um, but I think the lasting impact is there. And although maybe this first wave of onboarding into, um, I guess, solidifying digital art as a, as a collectible and valuable, quote unquote, art form, just as painting, sculpture, et cetera, um, it really, it had uh, unprecedented effects. So I think now the onboarding has become maybe easier because people are accepting digital art as an art form um, that is exhibited in museums and, and collected and, and all that. So I think there's been a very positive kind of impact of this very negative speculative bubble that we, that we experienced. Yeah, I think that transition um, involves like a, a shift in values or encouraging people to like rethink some values. And so I'm kind of like interested how Wasim and Celine would talk about this since you both are really interested in bringing together people who already share values. Is there any like onboarding that needs to be done in the work that you do? Should I start? Sure. Um, so yeah, I guess for us the notion of onboarding is a little bit different as it is for, for Carlotta because we're not um, onboarding people to a technology stack or a, a set of kind of um, uh, computational processes. So for us it's more of a, um, uh, in t I think of it more in terms of knowledge transfer and you can't really talk about knowledge transfer without talking about the organizational structures that, that exist. So I would say that the salon kind of mirrors the structure of a uh, academic research group uh, with a core team of researchers um, and then um, more like a rotating cast of fellows and residents and then we have this kind of like looser penumbra of community members uh, that would come to the events and uh, participate in our, in our projects. Um, when we would get some uh, funding or a commission to do a particular project then we would make a, a project specific team. And we usually draw on members of the community we already have I mean, because we're 50 events deep into an event series, we already have a regular constellation of people that come to these events both in Berlin and, and online. So they're kind of, you know, there's a definite locus in, in Berlin, but they're also kind of ge geographically um, dispersed. Uh, so for us, the, I guess it's, onboarding means different things in terms of what the um, interaction, the modality of interaction is going to be like. Um, but for us, because we do these, you know, face-to-face -face, uh, events, like people are kind of onboarded into the community through the like the joy of sharing knowledge and wisdom in these like uh, intimate conversations, and then from there, you know, we said that the word community can be misaligned. Like I've uh, spoken at Web three conferences before, where I've um, uh, posited a possibly very negative connotation of community, which is source of free labor, um, and so you know, <laughs> try to avoid that notion of community and onboarding. Um, but yeah, so for us, it starts with the, with the events and with the human connections we make. And then from there, we start to, to build bridges and links as the uh, different projects and different modalities of interaction emerge. I think you were talking about onboarding in the context of like tech, like learning a new technology or something. But I feel like maybe it could be useful to talk about how we onboard our students into the community. So we have orientation, just like a regular school, and it's very fun. Um, and we also have a really special community agreement, which other institutions might call a code of conduct, um, that we wrote in collaboration with a transformative justice consultant slash social worker that we keep on staff because um, often we're like teaching folks about ideas that make them realize that they're complicit in a horrible system and then they don't know how to cope with it. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so I think like we, so this onboarding or like signing of the community agreement together like helps create 
in an environment where fe people feel comfortable being uncomfortable together, asking questions about um, things they don't know. And sometimes, you know, we have a really interdisciplinary and diverse, in many meanings of that word, student population, um, because like folks will come to the school like, oh, you know, Joe is a tech worker in San Francisco and he never had the chance to study art, but he always wanted to. So he like takes a 10 week class at SFPC and is like, I can't wait to think about art. I just code all day. And like, <laughs> and like Jesse is a poet who does, who's, who's always been like, I've been curious about the possibilities of computation, but I've never dedicated the time or space to think about it. And um, I haven't really felt welcome in other sorts of learning communities because they're very male dominated. <laughs> and then Joe and Jesse get together and take a class and like read this, you know, like sign this community agreement. And the class is about, um, we have this amazing workshop taught by Melanie Hoff uh, about consent and learning how to use your computer terminal where all the students are paired up and you know, they make a contract together and they're like, here's what I want you to do in my terminal. Here's what I don't want you to do in my terminal. Here are the boundaries of where I want you to explore in my terminal. <laughs> and then everybody like, you know, get, like remotes into the other person's terminal and like does this exercise together. And you know, maybe Joe is like, wow, this contract. I'm like, really, this, this is a new concept for me. And Jesse is like, I'm struggling <laughs> with how to do this. And they help each other out, um, you know, under the understanding that it's like a mutually supportive situation, I think. Um, for us, like that's what onboarding means. It's about, yeah, like facilitating this knowledge exchange in a like, safe and, um, ex you know, like open environment. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking now about what Anna Maria said at, toward the beginning where, you know, you kind of thought that your work would be outreach to traditional publishers and other writing communities when it really becomes about like the people who are building new communities who are open to new ideas and trying new things. Um, I also wanted to talk about um, something that you, you brought up, Lassim, how there is this sort of like core group of researchers and then the penumbra of people who are associated or interested um, and how that kind of maps onto the face-to-face uh, -face versus online interaction. So I kind of wanted to hear from the rest of you about um, thinking about people with different levels of participation in the community. I think like sociologists talk about um, strong ties and weak ties, you know, in any kind of social group, there are people who are really dedicated and, and sort of, you know, at the center of it. And then a lot of people who are somewhat affiliated come in and out. Um, how do you sort of negotiate between the, the strong ties and the weak ties? Um, is it good to have more of one than the other? Um, and also, I mean, uh, and, and how does that like map onto doing things in person versus um, getting people together online? Carlotta, do you want to talk about this? Since you're so, you, you really value experiences, right? And that's... Um, yeah, well, we're just getting started, so we haven't had uh, that. But um, I guess in, co in the context of Vivarts, uh, what we're trying to achieve is, um, and talking about like more strong versus weaker ties um, is a way in which we kind of, the artist decides uh, to what extent they want to engage with their community and hopefully, and our, our goal is that over time that engagement will maybe change, transform, depending on maybe what stage of the creative process the artist is in. Um, and based on that, actually, different collections will be um, made available to the public depending on, on specific things. So we're hoping to kind of implement certain maybe gamification aspects that encourages participation um, in the online communities that then translates into that offline interaction. Um, so we're, that's, that's kind of how we're hoping to see. And then based on, I guess, trial and error, we'll be able to identify what works, what doesn't, what are uh, audiences responding to more and less, um, and, and grow from there. Did you want to talk about this, Anna Maria? Sure. All right. <laughs> um, I think that um, when a poet sees their work exhibited for the first time, 
Um, this is able to communicate to them much more than what I can accomplish on a video call. I can tell them, you know, come work with us. We want to show your work. We want to pair you with an artist. But to see their actual poem exhibited in a gallery, and you know, fortunately, we've had really, really wonderful partners who've believed in our work since the very beginning. And so we've been able to exhibit um, poems, you know, in wonderful places. I mean, like at Unit London, for example, just to mention um, one of the few places where we've we've been able at, at New York in, in Kadaf. I know we have friends in common there, um, the Contemporary and Digital Art Fair. They really get it. They get that they're reaching beyond, that there is something more than a poet can aspire to than to have their work published in a journal. I was, I was recently interviewed and I told them, you know, I, was, I just had an essay called Virginity published in a journal. It's uh, run by the University of Milwaukee. It's a really prestigious journal. It's really exciting, but no one's gonna read it. That's the reality. Who reads this publication? I really actually don't know. Um, but then if I take this essay, this short um, creative piece, uh, nonfiction piece, and turn it into a poem and perhaps share it at Art Dubai, maybe hundreds of people will engage with the work. And that, I think, is really what the eye-opener is for the poets. They are connecting with new audiences, and new audiences, in turn, of course, are connecting with them and discovering the poets. I can't tell you how many curators have come up to me, how many gallerists have come up to me, how many people, or even artists, saying, you know, I really didn't know that I liked poetry. But now I know that I like it. And, and not to mention collectors who are now collecting poetry. Um, you know, now I, I, I just realized I actually like poetry. And so for me, that is really the explosive. That's really where the magic happens. And I can't really communicate that as effectively as I'd like to via, uh, you know, a conference, a call. Once it happens is when really um, the change happens. Uh, Selena, I know SFBC has, you know, this one has been around for 11 years, as you said, so there are like hundreds of alumni out in the world. Like, what kind of community does that create? Yeah, it's, I'm definitely thinking pretty hard about your question because I, like, I don't feel like we've been able to successfully, like, like activate some of the community. We have a Discord now, and it's a little touch and go like I feel <laughs> it's like this really, always like that yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I would say so to like paint like a geographical picture of it like most of our community is US based um, though definitely with going online we've managed to branch out a lot depending on the time zone <laughs> um, I feel like the New York community, whenever we've had pop-ups at different art institutions, like we recently did a project at Pioneer Works, um, which is a like large arts organization, in New or physically large warehouse space style arts organization in Brooklyn, um, which is quite difficult to get to, I should add, because it was, I mean, I know you, you came. <laughs> we had an event there um, on a very cold day, and I was kind of nervous that no one was gonna show up and it sold out and it was packed and there were like hundreds of people and I, I thought, wow, our community is really showing up uh, so big you know, for us. Um, so I think there is definitely, yeah, a desire for in-person interaction for sure. I mean, speaking just from our experience in New York um, and I don't quite know how to like bring that to our you know, alum, you know, we have a couple alum in Australia, for example, <laughs> I'm like, what can I do for them? You know, how can we bring them back into the fold? I don't know, we're still figuring it out. Well, Sim, you, you addressed this earlier. Is there anything more you wanna say about it? I guess like, um, you know, we're talking about the, 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 the meeting point between URL and IRL, between the online and the, and the, the, the real. Um, and one of the things that we want to do that we haven't done yet, so we've, we've been doing the salons for four years, and since the beginning we've had a desire to, to operate across a London-Berlin axis. And I've kind of been operating along that axis my whole professional life. But the pandemic made it very hard to do real events, let alone in multiple places. 
Um, but right now we're seeing like a lot of interest and a big community that is like really willing to help us make it happen in, in London. Um, so um, I appreciate that New York and Australia are quite far away, but London and Berlin are much closer, so we can actually bring the salon to the community in different places. Um, and that's one of the things that we uh, really want to try and do. I just want to add that we, so prior to my tenure, we did do a pop-up project in Detroit. Um, and we did another one in Yamaguchi, I think, where, where YCAM is in Japan. Um, and so there have been experiments where we've brought like workshops and came to other communities rather than say, okay, everyone come to New York in the most, um, like, especially in Detroit, like that involved a lot of meeting with local organizers, making sure we weren't being like weirdly colonial, <laughs> um, addressing what the communities needed. Um, I think, you know, it would be great to be able to do that again, but since we've like grown up into an institution, it's quite expensive to like make that happen. Um, Detroit was supported by the Knight Foundation. Um, and I think, yeah, like maybe we're not so independent anymore. So. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's been a challenge for us, the cost of it all to get places, yeah. Yeah, I, I think this also, uh, brings up another question I had about scale, which in you know the, the for-profit tech world is sort of always the goal. You want to get bigger, you want to make more money, uh, but if you're independent, maybe that's not necessarily a measure of success. Uh, and so I'm kind of curious, like you've all talked about um, onboarding people, growing, is scale something, is scaling up something you aspire to? Do you want to get bigger and do you see that as a measure of success or do you have some uh, reservations about that? You're looking at me. <laughs> I'm looking it's at my turn. all of you. <laughs> why, don't, why don't you start? Yeah. Um, so we actually applied for a grant. Um, it's our second grant from the Tezos Foundation. Tezos is a blockchain, um, and we pitched a grant for a year of rereading, um, which I guess is anti-scale. So we said we are going to not curate any more exhibitions. We're not creating any new work. What we want to do is consolidate what we've done. So we've got a series of really, I think, beautifully curated, um, very sort of encapsulated exhibitions, um, one with Ferrophile, for example, another one of poetry in Spanish, another one that questions the book object. Um, and we want to share these exhibitions throughout 2024. We don't want to do new work. Um, we want to look back to affirm what we've done. And for me, that is scale because it's sustainable. Um, it wasn't sustainable for us to keep putting out new exhibitions and new exhibitions. And of course, there's this expectation about, you know, is it going to be a commercial success? Is it not? And what we're doing, in a way, transcends. Um, of course, you know, it's important to get these works sold and everyone, um, you know, remunerated for their efforts. But at the same time, we're really about changing minds and creating awareness about the potential of the blockchain for literary um, not only sustainability, but um, creativity. And so, you know, scale for me means to consolidate, to affirm what we've done in the past, and also to spread the word of what we're doing. So, um, you know, I've, I'm writing an essay for a, a, a big poetry journal that commissioned it, and that to me is a signal of scale. It says they've, you know, they picked up on the signals, and they think this is important, and they want to put it in their, in their, in their pages. Um, for me, scale doesn't mean becoming massive. Um, okay, for us, it's a more traditional <laughs> form of scale. <laughs> um, so we, um, I really love that, by the way. I think that's a really beautiful way of um, like creating scale because you're actually creating longevity to your project. So I think it's amazing. Um, in our case, we, um, our vision in the next, let's say, five years for Viv Arts is that we're starting off in a very curated platform, so we'll be inviting artists to work with us. We're excited about working from artists from all disciplines um, in the same way that poetry can become an art form that is experienced in a visual way. We, we are first, for example, working with a DJ for our first project and how they're exploring like how sound can be um, seen. So there's that dialogue that's quite interesting. And we our goal and our ambition is to build a strong enough community that um, it, 
within BivArts that over time allows, um, allows us to open up the possibility for any type of artist who has an idea for an experiential artwork uh, to submit it um, to the platform and sell their digital artworks and get it financed. And um, via the success, let's say, of the first projects and uh, through bringing big names at first, uh, maybe it'll bring that visibility to more emerging talent to be able to um, also realize their ambitious artistic dreams. So our goal is really to open the platform up over time and eventually um, create a sort of kind of Patreon style uh, website that really focuses on innovation within the experiential art world. Celine or Wasim, would you like to respond to this? Sure. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, I think, you know... <laughs> Great answer. We'll see. <laughs> we, <laughs> we see ourselves as more like one node in a network of independent schools, I would say, or independent learning environments. Um, like, I think, you know, we don't... Like I was saying about our project in Detroit, I think we're more interested in knowledge sharing about the ways that we're learning best in our environment, like in the U.S. It's very, like... American, <laughs> in a way, it's a very American school. Um, even though we try to prioritize, like quote unquote, like like non-Western, um, like com like com computational history canon. Um, but I think we're more interested in people building their own projects in their own context because they know what's best for their communities, and we just like love to be in touch with them. All right, so for us, scale is something we've thought about a lot since the, the very beginning. So like the, the very core of our activities are these salons, which are by necessity uh, curated and intimate happenings. So we've had them with as many as 35 people and as few as eight. We think the sweet spot um, for this thing to be like a really free-flowing peer, minimally moderated peer group conversation is between about 15 and 25 people. Any more than that and the louder voices get heard more at the expense of uh, quieter ones. And if you go too few, then uh, like, well, it's like a panel, yeah, like what we're doing today. Um, so some things can scale gracefully and some things it's more difficult. Um, so when intimacy is kind of one of the most important things to, to what you're doing, um, you've got to be very mindful as to what you uh, try to scale. Um, one thing that we noticed in the pandemic is we would come up with a new topic um, and uh, you know, it would generate more interest than we expected or that the previous one did. So what we would try to do is instead of trying to make the number of people in the room, so to speak, larger, we would instead have multiple parallel sessions so that we could maintain the sense of intimacy, which we think makes the, the happenings uh, special and worthwhile. Um, so yeah, for us, we went, we'd resisted the, um, the urge to make the core activity bigger at the expense of the, the intimacy. But that doesn't mean the organization itself can't scale in, in some kind of way. And so one of the ways we scaled the organization is we started a residency program. And that then meant we could take in, like in uh, 21, 22, we had five residents. And in 23, we had uh, another five residents. This year, we'll have three. And so this is a way of us bringing more people into the, uh, the inner circle of the organization so that we can uh, kick, it, kick up into a higher gear of activity. Um, but we still maintain these, like, as we talked about, the inner kind of tighter bound, the, the strong ties. Of, a, of an inner uh, uh, core of an organization, um, which in itself increases, is also a way of maintaining intimacy. Um, so yeah, for us, it's also a little bit like Celine said with SFPC, we see ourselves in a kind of a network paradigm, like you know, both in our community is somewhat networked, but also we um, have a lot of resonance with other, um, like say scholarly minded para institutions or para academic enterprises around Europe and, and, and uh, further afield. And um, one of the ways that we can scale without losing that sense of intimacy is by uh, sharing knowledge, values, and uh, humans across these uh, different uh, nodes in these new networks that we're making. So, yeah, uh, listening to your responses, it really strikes me that um, in these cases, scaling might not be about a particular organization getting massive, but it can be about um, new ideas sort of spreading and reaching more people, like the idea that um, poetry can be published and distributed in other ways or that like you can crowdfund experiential art through collecting digital um, art. Um, and I think that, you know, just to refer back to the title of the panel, that's how independent communities are unlocking the future of culture. It's by um, coming up with these new ideas. 
and, and, and seeing them like uh, affect other people, and it, it might like the organizations can themselves can stay small, but their ideas, um, you know, travel. Uh, I know we started really late, and I'm not sure when we're supposed to end at this point. I know everyone's had a really long day, and it's very jet lagged, but maybe we could take a couple of questions from the audience, if there are any. And I don't know if Layla's out there, she wants to tell me when we have to stop, but um, I just can't see anything because the lights are so bright. Uh, but yeah, any questions? Yeah. Just, uh... Do we have to spend it in three months? In one day. One day. Yeah. <laughs> if funding was not the issue, what would be the next step? I love that question. Uh, yeah, great question. I can start. All right. uh, for us, it's really simple because um, most of our um, expenses go on um, stipends, wages, like it's, we pass it straight through to the, to the researchers, to the residents, and to the people working on projects. So we have this enormous backlog of projects that we would like to do, and we're constrained by uh, funding and resources more than we are by the willingness and the human capability to achieve them. So like, we could spend your money extremely quickly, my friend. <laughs> um. If anyone does have a million dollars, um, there is a beautiful, wonderful museum in New York that actually wants to do a massive exhibition on digital poetry and uh, put it in its rightful place. Um, they don't need a million, they need approximately $450,000 to put it on in 2025, and it is a, a major cultural institution. Please find me after and <laughs> we'll, we'll make it happen. <laughs> Um, well, let's say if funding wasn't an issue, because I think a million dollars can go by very quickly. Um, I would uh, try to create, if I, had, if I had like unlimited funding, I would create a program that would um, basically uh, do a traveling, um, basically like a traveling program for experiential art in different museums. Um, I think whenever an experience-based artwork is installed in a new place, it brings in a whole new context a uh, whole new set of kind of interpretations and it, it can have a really valuable impact. Um, so, and, but these artworks are very expensive uh, to mount, to stage, to transport, all of these different things. So I would definitely try to create a sort of system that is sustainable that would allow um, museums from all over the world to collaborate together um, to host these experiences over time. Yeah, I think for us, well, I'm trying, so something I didn't mention is we're cooperatively run, and right now there are seven of us, and we're going to a smaller leadership team partially um, due to like <laughs> the reality of funding restriction, and also because we, it's very difficult <laughs> to have seven people all be responsible for everything. Um, and I think part of, that decision involved a commitment in the future towards thinking very carefully about cooperative governance and what that means in the context of a nonprofit business model in the US. So I think we would probably spend some of that money doing some research on that, compensating people for their time, and also expanding um, scholarship funding because we don't want tuition to be a barrier to study at the school. Any other questions? Yeah, Lorenzo. Um, do you worry about the quality? Oh, thank you. Oh, thanks. Hello. <laughs> My voice is already loud enough, but do you worry that the more you scale, the quality of what you do will depreciate? And if you were not to scale from present day, will you be happy with like keeping still with the progress that you already have? Yeah. Um, I can have a go at that. Um, I would say that no, because in the context of experiential art, as I was saying earlier, it's a very expensive art form. Um, so actually, 
I feel like there's a lot of talent and a lot of uh, interesting ideas that are left unrealized. Um, I visit a lot of artist studios and there's always that dream project that is sitting, gathering dust as a maquette somewhere. And um, I think there's some extremely valuable ideas. And if we find new ways to finance these ideas, then they're going to come to life. And um, I think there's just a lot, there's a lot to be done. So I guess no. <laughs> All right. Um, one, any last questions? One more? I guess. Uh, oh, wait. There is someone in the back who I can't see because of the lights. Very bright. Yeah. Yeah, very yeah, thanks for a great panel. Uh, my question is for Ana Maria. So um, you've uh, talked about onboarding poets into the digital platform, but I'm curious about how c we can onboard digital people into poetry. So do you find that your um, system is bi-directional? Are you finding that uh, the digital people that you involve in different communities begin to be more open, more interested in let's call it traditional poetry, or is it only the other way around? It's like, it's really disorganized. It's like little bursts. It's like you find one person who likes it. For example, this curator for the museum that I mentioned in New York, she, she got it and she reached out and she's like, listen, let's start thinking about this. Let's make this happen. Let's start fundraising. Let's, let's start knocking on doors. I'll start applying for grants because that's how much money it takes to, um, to put on an exhibition, and a lot of it is the handlers. It's putting on, it's actually, you know, hanging the screens in, in, in short. Um, and so that's a burst, right? That's, that's, a, new, that's a new market. Um, and then, you know, there's individuals will connect with my poetry and will collect it. And then that gets shared on social media, and that inspires a poet to write me and say, okay, I'm going to learn about this. I want to do this. I'm going to start following the verse first, and that's exciting, and I'm going to talk about it to my students. Um, but it hasn't been sort of this uniform, predictable, rising tide kind of experience, really. It's, it's really... Um, sort of like, you know, whack-a-mole. Things start popping and you go with, with what resonates and where there's a collection, a, a connection. Um, but I do think that at the end of the day, Web3 um, sort of rewards presence and um, the poets who are active are the poets who end up being acquired um, and start building a sustainable practice. And you know, I think that's fodder for an entire panel about sort of what the toll is on on a creative person to to always be present. Um, but but a lot of the poets really want to mint once while we hold their hands, um, and then expect us to sort of do it again for them. Um, and it's not until to go back to the question that Brian had asked till they see their work exhibited in real life and audiences engaging with it, that they really, truly get it. When it stays online, it's, it's kind of abstract. Um, but when they see it in person, then they're like, okay, yes, this matters. I don't care, I don't care how complicated it is. I don't care if I have to deal with, you know, at that age it was hick it nuck or whatever, I, I'll deal with it, but this is worth it. Um, so I hope that answered your question. <laughs> Kind of. <laughs> no, I, I think it's it's inevitable that it'll happen. I wonder, follow up quickly, um, do, does the poetry change once they adopt the medium? No, it doesn't. For me, at least personally, I can tell you it doesn't. Um, it's, it's just a matter of expanding its bounds and seeing the best way to bring it forward um, as a digital artwork, if it's going to be a collaboration, if it's going to be a performance piece, if it's going to be sort of a bare bones graphic style piece, um, but that comes after the poem. All right, I think we can wrap it up there. Thank you all so much for coming and thanks to Archibald for hosting us.